Hello and welcome to The Trading Floor, the end of week episode when we wrap up some of the major themes in markets this week. And what we have on the agenda is to talk about NVIDIA earnings, another blowout. But I guess the big question is, what next? Has their shares now fully priced in the AI boom or is there more to go? So we'll discuss a little bit about valuations. And then also want to talk about BRICS. Not bricks to build houses, but bricks in terms of the emerging market block, which this week launched its biggest expansion in its relative short history. Uh, Some new additions to the club, but what are the long-term implications for the West? So we'll look to deconstruct that. But I've got a a treat for everyone. Piers (laughs) is back on the podcast. I am back. (laughs) I don't know what's uh, what's been going on. It feels like a lifetime. It has been a while. Well, I've been busy, and then I've been a bit, I've taken I've had a bit of time off. You know, recharging the batteries. Although my time off actually, I didn't really have much time to recharge the batteries. But anyway, was... well, the, the, you're you're talking up a big game. Like you're going to come back with vengeance here, and uh, you've got a lot of stored up market commentary to uh to get off your chest so yeah there is that there is also the fact i've been a bit out of the loop for a couple of weeks purposely just trying to uh disconnect let's just say um but um yeah it's interesting well, let, yeah let, 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 let's get kick it, it off and let's uh let's talk about nvidia yeah now I'll, I'll give you the numbers first Okay, But I guess the main point here is that everyone wants to know is, is now a good time to buy NVIDIA? Can we still juice it yeah. for a little further or is it time to bail? So NVIDIA reported an 88, so I did say that right, 88% jump in revenue driven by demand, of course, for its AI chips. Um, their adjusted EPS, $2.70, well above expectations of 209 Revenues 13.51 billion, well above expectations of 11.29. Better still, going forward, what do they think? Well, they continue to remain pretty bullish. Uh, They said that they see sales in the three months ending in October will be about 16 billion. Street estimates were down at 12.5 billion. So as we've known before, NVIDIA's performance driven by its data center business That's where it includes things like the A100, H100. These are AI chips essentially needed to to build and run AI applications. It's the easiest way to explain it. So think of chat GPT. They also approved an additional $25 billion um, in share repurchases. And to give it some context, NVIDIA's net income year on year, what do you reckon now percentage-wise? How much is it up, Piers? Oh, actually, net don't income. know that. Uh, I know the net income figure for the quarter, but I don't know what the growth rate is. I'm going to say uh, probably it's um, I'm going to go 250 percent. Okay, you need to double that. Wow. Or <laughs> well, not quite 429 percent on their <laughs> net income year on year. So yeah, let's just give 25 billion back because we can. But yeah. one of the things here was that was interesting is that I was looking at this as it came out on the night and the shares popped about 9% at the peak in aftermarket yeah. trade. That actually opened and popped higher on the open on the street the following day, but they actually finished flat. So they gave back all of those early gains. Now, is this profit taking? And if so, well, then is that it for NVIDIA? Is it now hit its kind of peak valuation? Can it go further? I mean, on the sell side of the market, 17 brokers came out after the earnings and having chewed over the numbers, they actually, 17 of them raised their price target for the stock. So what what do you think, having had a look at these numbers? Well, I mean, the the thing is, right, so the valuation, well, the the share price of this thing has has well it's tripled this year right so that so i know that last night or sorry on the evening of the 
the the, the results being announced, you got that 10% or 9% pop and then it kind of came back a bit. It, it's already it tripled. Um, and really the standout moment of the year, I think, just full stop. Macro, micro, probably the standout moment of the year was Nvidia's earnings, not not the ones released this week, but the ones that for for the previous quarter, where all of a sudden it was like, oh, what the hell? This AI thing is just just on a tear, and and Nvidia are absolutely perfectly placed for it, and their revenues just went gangbusters. And I think the thing back then was, is this a, a bit of a is this a bit of a, not a one-off, but are companies front-loading their chip purchases to try and clamber onto this AI race? And so NVIDIA would see a big spike in orders and then that big spike would start to dissipate. And I think what the, the thing about this earnings report is that, well, for now, the big spike isn't dissipating. It's It's kind of, it's sustaining. And I know we've only had maybe it's weird to think we've only had really six months of this AI explosion. It feels like it's been a lot longer than that, but it's only really been six months, but this, this um, order volume growth rate is still there six months on. Um, but yeah, as you say, the share price didn't go up. So I was looking at the, the valuation because the share price right now is at $477. Okay. It started the year, back at below 200. Um, well, if you go back to kind of December, yeah, it's about $133 back in December, right? So we've tripled, as I said, and you'd initially think, wow, right, tripling, that's got to be expensive. You, know, you can't triple and uh, not be expensive, right? But the thing about this NVIDIA share price, yes, it's gone up by three times, but has the valuation multiples exploded and changed and the key point to make is no they have not and that is because it's quite unusual i mean almost unique for a company of this size to have a valuation explode sorry to have a share price exposure explosion that isn't also combined with a valuation explosion and that's because you've got this unbelievably ridiculous revenue growth Mm. that's underlying it all people are comparing it to cisco on one front right cisco in the dot-com bubble had this massive share price explosion that was also a valuation explosion because there was no revenue growth along with it and with cisco who've had a couple of decades of really strong performance their share price still has not returned yet in 2023 the share price is still below the 1999 peak right so they had a share price jump without a valuation, sorry, without revenue growth. Whereas, yeah, for NVIDIA, it's different. So I was looking at the numbers. Their net income, as you said, has gone up 400 odd percent. Well, it's at three, $3.25 per share is their net income. Okay. Now, if you annualize that, now, firstly, that's quite a big if. You're basically saying they're going to create the same net income kind of profit in the quarter that's just gone. They're going to be matching that at least for the next three quarters in the future. And this is where it starts to get hard, where you're predicting into the future, right? But given they've had two back-to-back -back strong quarters and they've increased guidance for the quarter ahead, I think 12 months, there's enough visibility to expect NVIDIA to deliver the same net income rate you know, in the quarters that are ahead, right? So let's just annualize the $3.25 per quarter and make it $13 per share net income for the year right now if you use that as their their, their kind of profit then we talk about pe ratios their their price their share price to earnings ratio and that winds up at 36 times okay the current share price gives them a valuation that is 36 times their profit simplifying it now how does that stack up against other companies well apple for example Apple's PE ratio right now, based on their current share price, is 27 times. But Apple's revenue growth is single digit. Yeah, it's, it's like let's sub 10%. Mm. <laughs> NVIDIA's revenue growth is a hundred plus percent. So you could argue purely on that 
comparison, NVIDIA to Apple, that either NVIDIA is still way undervalued or Apple's overvalued. Hmm. So, and look, if you think about the S&P 500 index as a whole, the S&P 500 index, their PE ratio on average across all 500 companies is 20 times. So from a very simplistic kind of back of the envelope, PE ratio comp, NVIDIA is not overvalued here. It just depends on their growth rate and if it's sustainable. They're talking about tripling production in 2024 um, to try and keep up with the demand explosion. And you've got some analysts, I think you were saying, was one analyst, their price, talk, talk to me about price targets. Yeah, so so just to remind everyone, what, what's the share price trading at the moment? 477. Okay, so the ones I was seeing yesterday were north of a thousand. Top end, I think, was twelve or thirteen hundred. Right. Yeah, I mean, look, I so I think, and look, these the thing about these equity research analysts, that's the people that come up with these, pluck these prices. That's their forecast for what they think the price might get to. We're not quite sure on their time frame for that move, but um yeah I, I that's that's looking further into the future is what i would say and here's the big problem with ai as i said it's pretty much a six month old story for for the masses i mean obviously ai has been in the background been developed for a decade or so but it's a six month old story in terms of this demand explosion and what you can't so you can get 12 months visibility which is why i think the current share price of nvidia is fair at least it's it's not expensive, given its PE ratio compared to Apple. Looking out over 12 months, fine. Looking out beyond that, I just think, I don't know. I, it, it's, too, it's too unknown. For example, rumors have it that Alphabet are trying to develop their own chip, their own competitor to, to NVIDIA's and, and look, they've got cash to burn. They've got the money to plow into that kind of development program. And so who's going to win the race here ultimately in the long term? And whilst NVIDIA are the only game in town at the moment, I think it's inevitable that they're not going to be the only game in town in who knows when a couple of years time let's say you can you, you know you can't stop the alphabets of this world just striding in and competing and so yeah it's 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 it, i don't know price points of twelve hundred dollars feels like a bit of a punt to me at this point but their share price at 477 is not expensive yeah and I'm, i must add that there's a way to interpret these price targets because of the north end of that spectrum these would be very small boutique type research firms that you've never heard of uh, there was one or two names of the individual actual named analysts that are quite used to be quite big hitters on the street back in the day um, but it's in their interest obviously to take a north star approach of yeah. let's go here's the consensus on the street and let's say the consensus sits at eight eight fifty. I'm going to go twelve hundred, <laughs> and I'm going to I'm going to justify that through my financial modelling to punch out what is going to be my target, which is the most bullish estimate on the street. Because if you think about it, if everyone's talking about Nvidia in the timing with their earnings, what's the one that you think the media will push as a narrative? The question on everyone's lips is, where's this thing going to go? Well, if you sit as the single outlier on the top end, they're going to talk about you. And therefore, yeah. you've served your purpose then in terms of bringing visibility to your to your firm. And can I extend that point? Because there is a conflict of interest slightly, because it's not only that getting your name out there and then, you know, fine, your, your profile rises. There's actually a direct revenue link to that because... Ultimately, if you're a fund manager, right, and you're sat there and you own NVIDIA stock, it's in your portfolio, you're like, well, hey, it has been a phenomenal few months. 
I've made so much profit on this trend, right? Should I start booking profit? Should I start taking a little bit off the table here? Or is there more upside, right? And as a, as a fund manager, you want to try and tap into research that's being done by the equity analyst experts. And when I say tap in, I mean buy, right? You, you buy this research. And so if I'm a fund manager and I'm sat on a big position with a big current profit, do I keep it? Do I not? What I want to do is find, right, give me an analyst who thinks that this current price is overvalued and their, their target's back at 300, right? I want to buy that research because I want to see why. What's the justification that analyst gives for a bearish outlook? And then it's the opposite, right? Well, who's the most bullish, right? How, why are they the most bullish? Okay, I want to find out. I'm going to buy their stuff so I can read it. And then I can get this got kind of 360 view on opinions to then go, okay, I'll digest all of that. And then obviously as a fund manager, I then make up my own mind as to, to which which way I want to go. So it can actually, you know, getting an outline, it's almost like, I don't know if this guy at $1,200, whether his actual first model came out with a $900 valuation and then, oh, well, let me make a few little tweaks here to massage it up. So yeah, I can be at the top of the list. And therefore, maybe attract more demand for my research, and I'll make more money. Hmm. So there is that slight conflict of interest. That Such you a cynic. Such a businessman, Pierce. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's all about it's all about the revenue. <laughs> all right. Well, look. Let's uh, let's move on and let's uh, attempt to unpack this brick story a little bit. And so the headline news of the week. <laughs> was a group of guys all holding hands on a stage, looking very pleased with themselves. But the BRICS emerging market block has launched its biggest expansion in its history as Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE were all invited to join this thing called BRICS. So I guess we need to start from the top before we start looking at some of the individual elements of this conversation. So the yeah. BRICS, I know you've spoken about this before, but maybe you could give us a shorthand of what that is for those not in the know. Yeah, well, the shorthand is quite interesting because uh, so the term BRICS, the acronym, um, was actually coined by a Goldman Sachs. Um, well, he was the head of global economic research at the time, a guy called Jim O'Neill. And in 2001, so it was kind of post-dot-com bubble, right? Everyone had just been burnt by the tech bubble bursting. Um, and so Jim O'Neill, who became a bit of a rock star, you've got to say, probably one of the most famous kind of global economic research analysts ever. Um, he kind of came up with this idea that, right, who are going to be the next, who are going to be the fastest growing economies in the next decade or two? This is So this is in 2001. Who are going to, therefore, from an investment point of view, from a macro investor's perspective, which companies should you be backing? And he came up with five. And the five being Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. He only put them in that order because, not because of their, their size at that point or their potential growth rate. It was the best order to come up with a you know, and uh, to coin an acronym that, that kind of you could speak BRICS. Okay, so this is where it came from. It was a an investment um, idea that then gathered huge momentum and became this product, essentially investment product, where you started to get you know uh, brick exposure kind of products that were being flogged by these big banks. Okay. So that's where it all started. It actually wasn't until 2009 that the investment idea actually turned into an actual political club. So it was only in 2009 that these five, the leaders of the five countries actually got together and said, you know what, let's, let's kind of piggyback off this sort of trends and, and let's form actually an, an actual political alliance. Okay. So interestingly, with the timing there, 2001, the Western world led <laughs> dot com explosion and 9 11. 2009, global financial crisis, Western led. Mm -hmm. 
because I think there's a pattern here which we'll probably draw back to when we start concluding yeah. this matter. 2023 post COVID. Right. Yeah, I wonder whether there's something in that with look, it's not a secret that China, who are easily the biggest of this group of five, and when I let me just pause, when I say easily the biggest, I've been looking into the sort of relative sizes of these economies and you know of the five china's easily kind of outperformed so china's economy is at 17.9 trillion dollars that's their gdp per year 17.9 the next biggest is india which is only at 3.4 trillion Uh, then you've got russia at 2.2 trillion then it's Brazil at 1.9. And then you've got little old South Africa. We'll come back to this point later. It's only at, it's only at 0.4 trillion. All right. Um, anyway, um, yeah, China's obviously the biggest and has done the best. And look, it's no secret China want to uh, compete with the US to start with on the global stage in terms of a superpower and then supersede them right and so yeah i think that ultimately china probably have used the timing of these economic crises that have been well certainly the dot-com bubble and the financial crisis were centered in the west you could uh, you know obviously covid's been slightly different but yeah using the the fallout from an economic crisis to then go right let's try and you know, regroup, let's try and expand and grab hold of more power whilst others are at their weakest and most vulnerable. Yeah. So, I mean, let's just cover off some of the um, the actual composition of this group and, yeah. and, it's, and how it's comparable to others. And then we can start to explore some of these other more geopolitical links that it has. So... I was just trying to kind of pull together what could be a something else that this would be akin to. Um, and the group is not a formal kind of multilateral organization. So it's not the UN or the World Bank or OPEC, but it certainly is heading that way because they have set up their own bank, so to speak, for certain nations to tap into emergency funding so there are lots of offshoots and uh, an uplift to being part of this club. Um, yeah. To give that percentage, you're talking a few there about the the trillion dollar nature of the size of the economy. Brick nations account for more than forty percent. This is just bricks, so this is without the inclusions here. Forty percent of the world's population. You know, and one of the most meaningful ones actually happened this year. Um, so in March, they surpassed G7 nations in terms of GDP. And also India is now population wise, number one, because I think the kind yeah. of assumption is that that's China. Uh, but that, that has changed as well. Um, so apart from geopolitics, you know, what I, I guess, fundamentally, what is the upside to joining the BRIC club? And essentially, this is tied around economic cooperation, uh, multilateral trade, development, all these types of things. And one of the things I think that is the easiest to comprehend is that economically, Brazil, Russia's natural resources and farm products just make them an absolutely natural fit for someone like China uh, from that perspective and that kind of passage then of the products that we're talking about, soft agricultural ones, so farming related. So when you talk about um, corn, ingredients for pig feed for pork in China and things like that. And then flip it, you talk about the pursuit of industrial growth and the consumption of energy products. And you throw someone like Russia in the mix, uh, obviously strategically. So that kind of hopefully gives it a bit of a flavor of like the necessity to be in this. So going back to your point, then you've had COVID and I actually think that COVID is uh, the the commonality between those episodes in the last three decades that you mentioned. Uh, And the reason why is that I was reading about why the African nations in particular want to sign up because the 
uh, the number that was going around was that there were 40 countries that wanted to be invited to attend this event who all won in at this point. Yeah. Um, and one of the main things here was the view that the dollar's dominance over the global financial system is impeding these nations' economic growth, particularly because in the US you've had interest rates go up at a very well unprecedented steep trajectory um, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, all of these things has strengthened the dollar against all major other currencies and raised the cost of importing goods priced in dollars. And so then what other alternatives can they look for? And I think Egypt is a good one who joined the bank, i.e. the BRIC bank in February to help ease the shortage of greenback. And what they were saying at the time was that they had p- plan to pay for imports from India, China, and Russia in their local currencies instead of the US dollar. So it's kind of moving this gradual shift away. I mean, one of the points of research that I saw out of Goldman Sachs that they've put out recently was talking about growth projections out to 2050. And they were talking about the fact that based on their projections, Asia uh, XDM will represent 40% of global GDP by 2050. The developed markets expected share 36%. Hmm. Now, if you were to go back 50 years, the DM has represented over 75%. So the, the balance of power between the dominance of the West has shifted already dramatically in the last 25, 30 years. And the idea being that it will continue to do so quite aggressively. So this kind of moving away from the US dollar, which has obviously been quite a prevalent theme, is is continuing at the moment. So that that yeah. I think is a yeah, this underlying, as you I think said at the beginning, this no big, it's no secret. There is a long-term strategy here, and I guess led by the de facto most wealthy and and by size dominant factor which is that of china but what's interesting is when you actually start to break down all of these different players who've been as part of this latest inclusion they've all got unique reasons why they want in basically um and i think just running through a couple of these i think saudi arabia is probably the obvious one because we know we've seen saudi arabia Stephen and i have talked about this they've been incredibly proactive to kind of throw out the tentacles into all different spaces in this quest to diversify away from uh, fossil fuel industries. Yeah. And they need to be lining themselves up for um, just further sources of buyers, essentially, and aligning themselves to who's going to be the most affluent customers in the future. And certainly that relationship with China and the common thread here will be the geopolitical tension that gets tightened with all of these nations every time that they move a step closer into the the brick club, so to speak. Um, and then you, you know you've got others like you know you talk about the UAE and Dubai uh, and their kind of quest to make that the, the kind of the de facto central financial hub. And again, where is all that activity? And you follow the money, and it kind of leads back to the China train again. Yeah, um, and then Egypt. Uh, I think Egypt is a country where they're going through absolute economic turmoil <laughs> at the moment. If you want to check out some currencies, you know, if yeah. you're feeling a bit spicy, check out the lira in Turkey, and then check out the Egyptian pound. Uh, that will get your pulse racing. But the idea being here is that I don't think there's an immediate payoff having Egypt in, but Egypt has a very prized strategic asset being the Suez Canal, which is absolutely integral for the passage and movement of trade and goods through the Middle East into the Mediterranean to serve the West. So there's definitely a lot of things going on here. There's Iran as well. And I think one of the other things that really stood out to me with this latest inclusion is two names that you don't really expect to see on the same billing, which is Saudi Arabia and Iran. Now, I think it doesn't take too much of an explanation to go into it. They're essentially 
different sectoral beliefs of the Islamic faith. Let's just leave it at that. And so therefore leads to quite hostile relations between those two nations in history. And so bringing those two together, how does that work? But then Iran has always been strategically quite close to the likes of China, who have been quite open and active buyers of Iranian oil through Western sanctioning. And then Iran's very closely tied to Russia through military arms uh, yep. connections. So why do they want Iran? Well, Iran, for all of its economic difficulties, has a monumental deposit of oil sat in its geography and thus it's a very important asset to acquire and have within your portfolio as far as these bigger i think more powerful nations like china are concerned um the big problem here of course and i guess the inevitable one is that by aligning all of these countries you're essentially challenging the west uh, in an increasing fashion, it's kind of like Russia getting very apprehensive about the ever-expanding NATO getting closer to its geographic border, right. and therefore action must be taken. At this point in time, the BRICS have just taken a very symbolic piece of action. They've just expanded <laughs> And some of these countries that they're including are strategically both from a commodity and a populist and thus GDP productivity point of view, very increasing the power. Um, and I know you've you, you know you've got some stats over. This isn't all complete plain sailing. There are some countries in here where well, even within the BRICS, yeah. there's not quite a uniformed agreement here, um, well, where they all well, see the same page. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that it's been um, there, there has been reluctance from, let's say, South Africa and India to expand. So reluctance from internally the original BRICS to expand this club. It's kind of been China have been pushing for it for for years, but it's always never quite happened. And I think from South Africa's point of view, particularly. Um, they have always been the most reluctant to expand the club. And that's just because it's just turned out that they haven't really delivered on growth like the other five did, as Jim O'Neill predicted. Um, you know, when you're looking at the South African GDP growth rate, then back in the early noughties. So remember, Jim O'Neill formed this investment idea in 2001 and their GDP was at... Um, what was it, 135 billion? Okay, it then over the next five years, it doubled. So great, massive growth. And then over the next five years to 2010, it pretty much, roughly speaking, doubled again. So their, their, their 2000 to 2010 growth rate was unbelievable off the scale, phenomenal. But believe it or not, their GDP in 2011 is still the highest GDP year in their history. And actually, here we are in 2023, and we're like back at 400 billion compared to 460 in 2011. So really, the last 15 years has been a real struggle for South Africa. And so relatively speaking, their size within the club has been diminishing and diminishing and diminishing. Their size has been diminishing, so their power has been diminishing. And they're quite nervous about this idea of China's ambitions to grow the club and bring in other partners who are way bigger than South Africa. And so ultimately, South Africa feel like their power within the club will be, even though an original member will be diluted and diluted and diluted and diluted, and they'll be kind of forgotten about. Um, so that's their angle. Um, I'd say for India, they're in a slightly different situation where it's probably more political where they're reluctant to have anti-West, like so China and Russia are super keen to get the likes of Iran in play. Fair enough, as you say, from an oil point of view, but also very much from a political point of view. But India are kind of caught between a rock and a hard place here because they, they're very much aligned with the West and they they want to continue positive ties there. But, but then equally, 
you know, they can see that long term, the economic power shift and trends are well in place. And yeah, of course, you know, the Asia and, and China, you know, uh, will will become the biggest economic portion of the planet. And so they 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 don't want to lose their position in this club. So yeah, you've got some reluctant internal members to expand this thing. Yeah. And then on that in point of India, um none of these BRIC nations have actually uh, formally backed um the the Silk Road kind of plan, this imp- right. massive supersized infrastructure project that China wants as its long-term ambition. And that is a particular point of contention for India because strategically part of that infrastructure build from China is a very strong alignment with Pakistan um, as an economic belt. And so that brings up lots of territorial dispute with India for lots of issues over partition, things like that many years ago. And so you know, what's interesting, uh, I think you were mentioning before about, okay, so perhaps there's a bit of horse trading going on here where it's like, we'll let you have this relationship with Pakistan if you let us then solidify our military base because India is now the biggest population on the planet and yet their military is nowhere near the size of China because China have been working that military budget for quite some time even albeit still much smaller than the US. But who else has bigger military presence and strategic presence as well? In terms of geography, it's some of those nations uh, that you've mentioned, like the UAE, Egypt. Right. And do they need, is part of the compromise here, closer alignment with them militarily for sign off then for you getting closer to Pakistan from a China point of view? Yep, absolutely. And other things, I mean, like looking at the, let's just quickly look at the others, right? So we're talking about Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, Iran. There, there are two other joiners here. One's Argentina, and then the other one's Ethiopia. Um, Argentina, a decent sized economy. Like they're they're clocking in at 0.6 trillion per year, so they're 50 percent bigger than South Africa from a GDP point of view. Um, and obviously bringing in another South American partner to kind of join Brazil. The, 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 the slightly odd one for me is Ethiopia. Just, just purely on size, when you look at the size of their GDP, they're 0.13 trillion, okay? They're like one third of the size of South Africa. They are now easily the smallest, um, but digging into it a little more, um, what probably a lot of the listeners don't know. And actually, to be honest, I didn't know either until like 30 minutes ago. Their growth rate is off the scale. I mean, Ethiopia's growth rate is just phenomenal. They're still relatively quite small, but they're they're getting less small fast. Um, And so their growth rate is off the scale. Go and have a look at uh, an Ethiopia uh, GDP chart. It's it's not far off exponential. They've been pretty much doubling every five to seven years, a little bit like South Africa in the noughties. Um, So, yeah, they're certainly one of the uh, emerging African nations. um, And so maybe that's that's a play. But also Ethiopia, you know, a lot of these countries that are clambering to join, I think have been incredibly... Uh, they've seen the benefits of lots of China investment, like infrastructure investment and so on. And so, you know, it's just about further cementing that relationship um, with their rich uncle, um, Xi Jinping, who's been pumping a lot of money into building out infrastructure in their country. So that that's certainly one thing. There are, there are some notable absentees from this, from the new joiners list. If you just like take your pen and scroll down the GDP chart where you're looking at countries by just purely by GDP, then there's some notable absentees. Uh, And I'm not including developed markets here, right? So these are all emerging markets that are looking to join this club. The biggest non-developed market that's not involved here is Mexico, but obviously they're going to be very much not joining because of their um, uh, geographical location and dependence on the US, of course. So they don't want to rock um, 
They don't want to rock that boat. The next biggest one is Indonesia. So that's an interesting one. And actually, it turns out Indonesia did get invited, but they've said no. They've said no for now. Their, their line at the moment is they're going to continue to think about uh, and analyze the merits. Um, but yeah, they're the kind of biggest. Yeah, the, the, the Indonesian story, I was reading into that. And obviously their decline is that you know, for the reason they don't want to upset their relationship strategically with the Americans. Yeah. But that history dates back to Indonesian independence. And that was brokered by obviously the superpower of the day, the Americans in 1945. Right. And so as a byproduct of that happening, the relationship there is then a strategic partnership. And obviously, if you look on a world map, the military tie for trade routes and maritime passage, if you want to be the world's largest economy like the US, you need to shore up that strait that includes going through Indonesia. Yes. So Indonesia is almost entirely dependent on the defense strategy being led by the US Navy. Um, then there's lots of other kind of brokered partnerships, which are more economic benefits. Um, and the fact that Indonesian US democratic countries, principles and human rights and all, all those other things. So yeah, you're right, though. I do think that for all of these nations, let's say there's a spectrum and Indonesia is leaning US. The problem is, is that US is a fading force. Right. And at what yeah. point then do you go, well, hang about that guy's military is much bigger than yours now. Yeah. <laughs> and their economy is going gangbusters while yours is declining. So at what point do you shift? Um, that time, of course, is coming. But that, that that's the geo, that, that's the kind of foreign policy challenge. They're trying to get a foot in both camps and not, well, well, yeah, not to, rock the boat of either. To to conclude then, with the trillion dollar numbers you were putting out earlier. So by 2050, this is how the world might look by sizes of economy, according to Goldman Sachs. Number one, China, 41.9 trillion. Push I, can I put it out there? I disagree with that, but go on. Push back into number two, US, 37.2 trillion. Number three, India, yeah, 22.2 trillion. That's the, the kind of the big three that they see. Yeah. I I'll put I'll put it out there. When we when we when we're on episode 48,956 <laughs> and it's uh March 2050. Um, I'll be telling you that ha ha ha, you were wrong. Uh, I don't think China will be the biggest economy by 2050. Ethiopia. <laughs> yeah, let's go. No, I think I think China are already fading from a growth point of view. I think they got huge issues demographically. Maybe we need an episode to properly. Dig into okay, so, that. Yeah, so just just quick snap then. So that means you're either backing India or the African continent, like Nigeria or someone like that. Yeah, so Nigeria for sure. India definitely. And and I actually think don't again don't discount the US. I know they're a fading force when you think about the proportional size. You know, relative to the size of the global economy is shrinking, but. I do think, like you look at, you look at the last decade, like post financial crisis, the U.S. just is phenomenal, just continues to march higher growth wise. It's just whether or not this, this quite sort of bipolar political situation is going to kind of hinder that continued growth. But um, but yeah, I think the U.S. will be there or thereabouts still. Yeah. I feel like I, I I feel like we've come to the episode, but I want to challenge you on the China point, and I want to challenge you on the India point because I disagree on both. Okay, but, well yeah. that's that's next week's episode. Let's go. <laughs> All right, cool. We'll wrap it up there. So thanks everyone uh, for listening. Thank you, Piers, and we'll catch you next week. Take care. Have a good weekend.